We're going to start the March lecture series of Pemma Historical Society and Museum. Thank you everybody for your interest in our talk. Um, before I introduce Dr. Sean Evans, could I please ask you all to make sure you're, you are muted and your screen videos are off. It is a little bit of a distraction during the talks if people move around. This talk is being recorded and it will be available on Pemma Museum uh, website and you just have to follow the YouTube link to find it. It won't be on there straight away. It takes a little bit of time for us to top and tail it before it goes on. Okay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sean Evans, who's the director of the Institute of Study of Welsh Estates at Bangor University. And as you can see from his wonderful display on our screens, the title of tonight's talk is An Ancient Seat of a Gentleman of Wales, a Place of the Plas in Penance, Wales. Over to you, Sean. Yeah, Shirley, thank you very much, Shirley, and uh, good evening to everyone. Thanks very much for the, the invite to come and speak uh, to you this evening, and, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining too. Uh, and particularly a great pleasure to follow Dr. David Gwynn in this series of, um, of seminars too. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, Thomas Pennant, who was a member of the Welsh Gentry um, from Whitsford in Flintshire, who across the mid 18th century established a European reputation for his published works on natural history and his travel writing. And in the 1770s, he increasingly turned his attention um, um, to Wales and published a tour in Wales, which is a wonderful collaborative uh, assemblage of information and insight uh, about the six historic counties of North Wales and the border regions. And this tour became hugely popular and was hugely influential too. It earned him um, the, the title, the father of Cambrian tourists. Um, such was um, the influence of this work on, on later travel writing um, about Wales too. Pennant um, has really interesting things to say about the country house in Wales or the Plas, and that's what I'm going to be talking about um, this evening. Um, it's also very fortunate that uh, many of his works was illustrated by two of his draftsmen, uh, Moses Griffiths and John Ingleby, which means we've got plenty of images to illustrate uh, tonight's talk. Um, all the images I'm using tonight are uh, from the National Library of Wales, um, and you can see one of the, the digitised versions of, uh, of the extra illustrated um, tour on the link there. Um, also worth pointing out that over recent years, um, um, there's been a major uh, research project focusing on Thomas Pennant and his Welsh and, um, and Scottish tours. And if you go to the Curious Travellers um, website, you'll see a range of material um, about Thomas Pennant and his influence um, there. Before I start with my um, talk, I, um, I just wanted to refer you to um, to this uh, extract here. Um, Thomas Pennant, um, some of you may be aware, has very interesting things to say about Penmine Maur and its um, immediate area, um, mostly um, about how um, the terror it inspired in the traveller uh, across the, the North Wales coast uh, before the, the route over Penmine Mawr was, um, was changed. Um, but this extract here, um, he's approaching from, um, from, from, from the Bangor side. Um, before me soared the great promontory of Penmine Mawr, protruding itself into the sea and exhibiting a fine contrast to the fertility which it interrupts by a rude view of grey weather-beaten stone and precipice. 
I passed by Brynaneyad, a house late the pro in the, pro the property of Humphrey Roberts Esquire, now of his daughter and sole heiress, relict of Robert Wynne Esquire of Plasnew with Denby. A little farther is the small village and church of Llanvair Vechan, from whence is a very short ride uh, to the once tremendous road over this celebrated rock. And this, this quote is really interesting because it, I suppose it illustrates how he integrates the Welsh country house into his writing um, about Wales, how it sort of naturally fits into his portrayal of the landscape. So I'd highly recommend um, um, for any of you interested um, in, um, in Pen Maer Mawr and what Pennant has to say about it, to, to, to find a copy of his tour and to, and to read through that. Um, so to start my talk now, oh, this is um, Bryn and Nea, the, um, the um, the mid 19th century um, Gothic building that re that replaced the building talked about by um, by, by Pennant, which um, I think was demolished in the in the 1960s. I now speak of my native country. So began the first part of Thomas Pennant's A Tour in Wales, published in three parts between 1778 and 1783, reflecting on a number of earlier journeys um, and um, an accumulation of knowledge over the course of his lifetime. The insight which Pennant provides into the character of his native country, its landscape, its history, culture, traditions and natural history, is perhaps unsurpassed for the late 18th century. Penance Wales, the picture of the country he presents to the readers of his travel writing, is one where the country house or the place occupied an ubiquitous presence. They are everywhere, dozens of them, featuring almost on every page and in every part of the six historic counties of North Wales and adjoining border regions that formed the focus of his observations. For Pennant, the country house represented one of the core features of Wales, integrally connected to its history and culture, its landscape, its past, and a part of its present. From the late 19th century, an incredibly powerful political campaign by a radical nonconformist contingent succeeded in tiring these places as somehow separate or detached from Wales, as enclaves of Anglicisation which did not belong to the ideal version of Welshness, which was being characterized through the invention of a Gwerin community, portrayed as continuously at odds with the owners of Wales's country houses and estates as far back as the 16th century Act of Union. Writing in the late 18th century, Pennant paints a very different picture. In his writings, country houses and the long lineages of gentry occupants are celebrated as integral components of what Wales was all about. He was living and writing during a period of pronounced historical and cultural revival in Wales, characterized by what Priest Morgan has called an unprecedented outburst of interest in all things Welsh and highly self-conscious activity to preserve and develop them. Pennant's tour was at the forefront of this romantic movement to celebrate and indeed reinvent Wales to ransack the past and transform it with imagination, to create a new Welshness, which would instruct, entertain, amuse and educate, again, to use the words of Priest Morgan. The Plas is a fundamental part of the fabric of Penance Wales, integral for understanding the distinctive character, history, culture and identity of the country, just as important as the ancient monuments and antiquities, the historical characters and legends, the landscape features and the various events, traditions, myths uh, and so forth, which collectively make up his depiction of Wales and its localities. In some areas, country houses dominate his attention and narrative. In the Vale of Cluid, for example, he describes the churches and neat mansions which enliven the scene. Further north, Kinmel, Vainalvaur, Bodlewithan, and Pengwern are highlighted in quick succession as the key features. The old halls at Bodlewithan and Kinmel were at this point very different structures to the uh, neo Gothic castle and sprawling stately home which were to replace them in the 19th century. The new house at Penguern, described by Pennant, was partially destroyed by fire in the 19th century, by which point the Lloyds of Penguern had inherited the Mostyn family estates and transferred their primary residence to Mostyn. 
Pennant referred to Vainal Vaur, now located next door to Esputi Glan Cluid, as one of the best old houses in the county of Flint. Built by John Lloyd, the registrar of St. Asseth in the 1590s, complete with the fashionable crow-stepped gables first introduced to North Wales by Richard Clough, who had spent much of his career in the Low Countries, uh, Vainal Vaur is still largely intact and post-Covid is available for weddings and Christmas dinners and birthday parties and romantic getaways if you feel so inclined. What penance would have made of the indoor swimming pool, we can only guess. Likewise, Pennant's depiction of mould in Flintshire is saturated with reference to its country houses, a tract filled with numerous seats of gentlemen of independent fortunes, he said. Leeswood with its magnificent gates, Nerquis, the property of Robert Hyde, who enjoys it with great hospitality, Tower, where Pennant enjoyed the witty, the lively and agreeable conversation of William Wynne, Pentra Hobbin, a good old house, in addition to Hartseath or Herseth, Gwisani, Plasteg, and Riel. The prominence afforded to these places by Pennant reflects the reality of the influence exerted by country houses across 18th century Wales. They were the power bases at the heart of estates, large and small, which are joined and intermixed with one another to create a patchwork of landed interest and influence which enveloped much of the Welsh landscape. The form of society underpinned by the country house, its surrounding estate, and the hierarchies of obligation, deference, and reciprocity between land landowner and tenant, a master and servant ruled supreme. The owners of these places, at this point predominantly the gentry or squirearchy, sometimes the descendants of the older Helwer, with a handful of nobles, were, were the dominant force in the life of the country, capable of exerting influences which straddled local, national and indeed global contexts in areas as diverse as politics, law and order, defence, architecture, agriculture, music, literature, industry, colonialism. There are a few areas, there are few areas covered by Pennant where country houses and their owners did not hold sway. One exception was a tract near Llangochen, described by Pennant um, as chiefly inhabited happily by an independent race of warm and wealthy yeomanry, undevoured as yet by the great men of the country. I'm sure he had the winds of Wednesday in mind. The prominence afforded to these places and the esteem in which they are held by Pennant is perhaps un um, unsurprising. He was part of this world. The Pennants of Downing and Bichton in the parish of Whitsford were long established members of the Flintshire Debt Gentry, not of the same status as major landholding families such as their neighbours at Mostyn or the Hanmers, uh, the Conwys at Budrothen or the Davises at Gwasani and Llanach, but nevertheless bearing all the hallmarks of a family of gentle status. Um, a strong ancestral identity, myriad connections to other gentry families across Wales, a record of office holding in the county of Flint since the 17th century, an estate which was surveyed at just over 1,700 acres in 1772, and country houses in the parish of, of Whitsford, which physically embodied a claim to local status and authority. Pennant's wonderful local history of the parishes of Whitsford and Hollywell gives a clear indication of the influence and role exerted by his own family within the locality. Thomas Pennant inherited all of this on the death of his father in 1763. Thereafter, he was a country squire, a landlord, a master, a magistrate, as much as a, a travel writer and antiquarian. Appreciating his identity as a gentleman is critical to understanding his interpretation and depiction of Wales. This status not only induced him to paint country houses in, in a very favourable light, indeed celebratory light, it also importantly permitted him access to these places, an access which may not have automatically been granted to writers from other parts of society. This access to country houses on their owners played an integral role in the construction of his writings about Wales. He notes in the preface to part one of his tour, I look up to my friends for history and anecdotes latent among their papers or references to our writers, 
Among the gentlemen I am chiefly indebted to for information and respect in the present work, I cannot pass unthanked Philip York of Erdig, John Mitten of Halston, Thomas Mostyn of Talacra, Peter Davis of Broughton, Kenrick Eaton of Eaton, Paul Panton um, of Bagicht, Lloyd Kenyon of Greddington, Ro uh, Roger Kenyon of Kevin. To Owen Brereton, I owe the loan of the curious antiquities found in his estate near Flint. To which Richard w Williams of Vron, I am highly obliged for his poetical translations. This roll call of Welsh country houses on their own as points to a much deeper body of correspondence and exploration within the country house libraries of Wales, which underpins Pennant's de descriptions of Wales supplementing and clarifying his own field notes and the research undertaken on his behalf by his faithful companion, Reverend John Lloyd. As Paul Evans has shown, in the early 1770s, Pennant composed a questionnaire for inclusion in the main North Wales, Chester, newspapers, so that local gentry and clergy could submit information about the history and antiquities of their parish, replicating a tactic used generations earlier by Edward Floyd. These research methodologies not only point to the significant interest in Welsh antiquities, history, genealogy, archaeology and manuscripts evidenced by the gentry during this period, men like Philip York and Paul Panton, it also recognises the country houses of Wales as the storehouses, the custodians of Welsh heritage and culture, history and tradition. The other important role that country houses played in Pennant's writings is that they very often framed his journeys. His tours can often be seen as trips from country house to country house, visiting relations, friends, kinsmen, and fellow gentry. Plas Gwyn, the seat of his friend Paul Panton, was used as the base for exploring Anglesey, which also included a visit to John Griffith at Carregloid. He stayed with his kinsman, Peter Davis at Broughton, whilst exploring the border region of Flintshire, Cheshire, and Shropshire. He was hosted at Bodvach near Llanbuchen and Gregunog for his journeys around Montgomeryshire, with their owners, Bell Lloyd and Arthur Blaney, acting as guides for their estates, localities and spheres of influence. Pennant was entertained for some days by William Vaughan of Corsagedal during his explorations of Merioneth. Hugh Griffiths of Brynodol provided the headquarters for exploring the Clean Peninsula, and while staying at uh, Gwynanog near Denby, Pennant rummaged over the family papers of the house. As well as providing good hospitality and entertainment and presumably a more comfortable bed than the local inn, these visits also served a practical purpose. Pennant's vivid commentary on his own patch, the parishes of Whitsford and Hollywell, was underpinned by his knowledge and experience of the area, he was part of the locality he was attempting to describe and celebrate. His stays at country houses across North Wales allowed him to tap into the knowledge and experience of the local landowner, whose family had occasionally resided there for centuries. Men like Arthur Blaney and William Vaughan and the archives and collections of houses um, um, at places such as Gwynanog and Plas Gwyn were viewed by Pennant as the best sources of evidence for the locality drawing on long-standing long links centred on the country house between lineage, land, lordship and locality, pedigree, power, people and place. Pennant used a rich variety of words and phrases to describe these structures. He called Bodidris a large and ancient place, Chirk an exalted pile, Erdig an elegant seat, Gregunog, a most respectable old house, Chloeni, a magnificent old hall, Pentrahobin and Nantcluid were both good old houses, Plas Teg, a singular house, and Plas Newith, simply a mansion. These terms were largely interchangeable. His most common form of referring to the houses was as the seat of, um, of a particular family, frequently the ancient seat of, a key word for understanding Pennant's portrayal of these sites. Country houses in Wales also incorporated a huge variety of building styles, uh, sizes and dates from former castles um, such as Chirk and Powys, stately homes such as Winstay and Llewenny, grand old mansions such as Corsa Geddel, and a huge number of smaller plastae like Pentra Hobbin. 
These buildings were the primary public statements of their owner's position with, uh, within the locality. As Pennant highlights in his history of Whitsford, in the plate of Mostyn is given the view of the seat of a gentleman of large fortune in ancient times, in that of Bichton, one of middling fortune, in that of the late Mr. Parry of Merton, one of small fortune. Despite the significant differences in the size and status, all of these places were recognized as a place or a country house. Based on the length of the descriptions and the attention afforded to them, you would probably point to Nanai, Penryn, Gwydir, Plasnewydd, Barren Hill, Mostyn, Chloeni, Winstay, Powys and Chirk as the chief houses in North Wales in the mind of Thomas Pennant. So why were they deemed to be significant? Especially in the 20th century, a period which witnessed the destruction, demolition or desertion of hundreds of these houses, including here in Wales, it was fashionable to interpret the significance of these places in terms of the loss of their architectural splendour and the breakup of the rich treasures and collections they housed. We know that Pennant was interested in architecture. He commissioned the Harden and Chester based architect Joseph Turner to provide plans for remodelling Downing Hall to achieve greater symmetry. However, in his tour, the architecture of Wales's country houses doesn't really feature as a major theme. He occasionally included short architectural descriptions, Broughton, a venerable wooden house, Hanmer, a modern brick house, Clanryada, partly ancient, partly rebuilt, Bryn Kinacht, the houses of brick built in 1619, Plas Newydd, the mansion has been improved and altered to a castellated form by the present owner. Um, but they certainly were not entries worthy, worthy of the Pevsner volumes. When discussing Riel near Mould, he comments that almost all the houses built in Wales from the beginning of the 17th century uh, to about the, the time uh, in which this was founded in 1634 are in the form of a Roman H, an intuitive conclusion which is not altogether accurate. He does provide a basic description of Penryn. The present building stand around a court and consist of a gateway, chapel, a tower, vast hall and a few other apartments. And he was also approving of Samuel Wyatt's plans for improving Penryn. He also recognises the distinctive design of tower or tour, again near mould, as a true specimen. Likewise, the great regularity and simple grandeur of Plas Teg, perhaps the most significant early Jacobean house in Wales. Likewise, Richard Clough's 1560s show house at Bacha Graig was sufficiently ridiculous to merit a detailed description. However, the paintings by his draftsman Moses Griffiths and John Ingleby are far more useful as a source of architectural history than Pennant's writings. This includes a number of paintings which are invaluable for assessing the architectural development of a number um, of country houses across North, North Wales. So if the significance of the Welsh country house did not reside in its architectural style or grandeur, why did they feature so prominently in Pennant's work? One of the best entry points for assessing the value Pennant ascribed to these places is in his report of a visit to a small old class in Merionifshire. Whilst journeying between Corsagedal to Harlech in Dufferin Adidwy, Pennant was encouraged by his travel companion, Reverend John Lloyd, to make a deviation um, to visit his relation in his ancient territories of Cumbuchan. Pennant describes in detail the picturesque routes they made through a wild horizon of rocks and rocky mountains. Wind up a rocky staircase road and arrive full in sight of Cumbuchan, embosomed with rocks of magnificent height. After a short ride, high above a lake of the same name, descend and reach the house of the venerable Evan Floyd, who, with his ancestors, boast of being lords of these rocks at least since the year uh, 1100. Pennant refers to the mansion as a true specimen of an ancient seat of a gentleman of Wales and gives a full description of its surroundings. The territories dependent on the mansion extend about four miles each way and consist of a small tract of meadow, a pretty lake swarming with trout, a little wood and very much rock, the whole forming a most august scenery. 
the naked mountains envelop his vale and lake like an immense theater. The meadows are divided by a, a small stream and are bounded on one side by the lake, on the other by his woods, which skirts the foot of the rocks and through which the river runs and beyond them tumbles from its heights um, in a series of cataracts. He keeps his whole territory in his own hands, but dis distributes his hinds among the havotis or summer dairy houses uh, for the conveniency of attending his herds and flocks. He has fixed his heir on another part of his estates. His ambition once led him to attempt draining the lake in order to extend his landed property, but alas, he gained only a few acres of rushes and, and reeds, so wisely bounded his desires and saved a beautiful piece of water. Pennant proceeds to give a full descent of Evan Floyd from Blevin at Cunvin. I was introduced to the worthy representative of this long line who gave me the most hospitable reception in the style of an ancient Briton. What follows is a highly romanticised personification of the traditional Welsh Achelor and the life of a place in former days. Here they have lived for many generations without bettering or lessering their income, without noisy fame, but without any of its embittering attendants. Pennant was welcomed at Cumbuchan with ale and potent beer to wash down the hung goat and cheese made from the milk of cow and sheep. He was shown the ancient family cup made of a bull scrotum and commented on the great oatmeal chests, the, the most remarkable pieces of furniture in the house, used to store the winter provisions. While speaking with Mr. Floyd, he, he was told the family legend of this house was the valiant Di Floyd, the subject of a notable Welsh tune addressed to him um, on, the, on, on the occasion of supporting Owain Laugoch or Jasper Tudor against Richard III. Um, the chronological inconsistencies didn't seem to matter. In this extensive port on, uh, report on Combach Buchan, we get to the nub of why Plastai feature so prominently in Pennant's tour and why they form such an important feature in the picture of Wales and its localities he was creating and presenting to his readership. Everything around Cumbuchan was synonymous with the house and its long lineage of owners stretching back centuries. The landscape, the livestock, the food and drink, the ancient cup, the traditions, the customs and legends were all integrally connected to the family and to the house. This part of Wales simply could not be understood without reference to the place and its associated pedigree. It was this combination, this association between Evan Floyd's ancestors and their house, which made this locality, which determined its character, its identity, its history. And crucially, this process of placemaking was still taking shape through the life and influence of Evan, the current living representative of Cumbuchan. What Pennant witnessed at Cumbuchan was to a considerable degree extinct across other parts of Wales. It is a highly romanticised account of, um, of a survival from a bygone era. In other parts of his tour, Pennant was severely critical of the old nature of the gentry in Wales, best encapsulated by his scathing remarks taken, taken from Sir John Wynne of Gwydir's family history on the gentry feuds which ravaged Ivionydd in the 15th century. Nevertheless, there are strong echoes um, of the core features of Pennant's celebration of Cumbuchan in his other descriptions of country houses across North Wales. Fundamentally, country houses were significant to Pennant and for his picture of Wales because they physically and symbolically preserved links between lineages and localities. In England, a place like Cumbuchan simply wouldn't be talked about within the realm of a country house. In Wales, its ancestral heritage was, was enough to give it that status. This is why Pennant so often referred to country houses as the seat of and as ancient. They were continuities in their communities which provide gateways into the past. This is reflected in Pennant's concise account of Glynllyfon near Carnarvon. Its significance was that a man named Kilmin Droid D, or Kilmin with the Blackfoot, one of the so-called founders or patriarchs of the 15 noble tribes of Wales and a nephew of Mervyn Vrych, Prince of Wales, had his residence on this spot. 
Glynclivon was named after its situation after its situation besides a small river called the Llivon. The gentry family who lived there were the Glyns, who took their name from that of the house. They claimed descent from Kilmin and bore as part of their coat of arms his black leg, which had apparently turned black whilst he was escaping from a demon, running away only to miss the leap over a stream, one of his legs plunging into the water and acquiring its black dye. This is representative of many country house accounts in Pennant's tour. Like his good friend Philip York at Erdig, Pennant was fascinated by Welsh genealogy and the five royal tribes and 15 noble tribes of North Wales. These tribes were each represented by a patriarchal figure or, or a founder, part historical, part legendary characters from a bygone era. The list of tribes were invented from the mid 15th century together with a coat of arms for each tribe or founder. In a world where ancestry was the primary marker of status, most families of gentry status in North Wales attempted to claim descent from these figures and display the associated heraldic, heraldic shield. And if a direct ancestral link could not be found to one of these founders who are said to have flourished in the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries, such connections could always be invented. This is why so many families in North Wales ended up using the same coats of arms. It also explains why Welsh heraldry is so very different from its English equivalent. For Pennant and much of the gentry of North Wales, this partially invented ancestral heritage was of huge importance because it embedded a family in Welsh history, providing status, honour, and most importantly, legitimacy for the enactment of local authority. Ancestry was a core feature of Welsh gentry identities. This is why the illustrated versions of Pennant's tour often contain uh, depictions of heraldic shields next to the descriptions of the houses. For Pennant, it was often enough for a house to be associated with one of the 15 tribes or some other ancient or eminent ancestral figure to merit inclusion in his tour. Rig near Corwen, for example, allowed Pennant to discuss the life of Griffith Ap Cunan and Owen Brugunton. Prasadved in Anglesey was worthy of note because it stood on the site of a mansion belonging to Huida Ap Kindelu. One of the reasons Maismunan, or Chlis Maismunan, was included is because Pennant accepted the tradition that Chlewelyn Ap Griffith, the last prince of Gwynedd, had a court there. Um, whose foundations till within these last few years were to be seen in an adjacent meadow. Wigvair near St Asaph, um, the seat of John Lloyd Esquire, was described in the following terms. He is derived patrilineally from Edenowine Bendo, one of the 15 tribes, and from Herd Molwinog by a female ancestor, in whose right he enjoys his ancient seat of Havadinos. Chlodiath in Montgomeryshire, which, which had recently been consumed into the sprawling land holdings of Sir Watkin Williams Wynne, was esteemed as a large old house, formerly the property of the great family of Vaughan, descended from Aleth Hain, King of Dovid of Pembrokeshire. As with the confused story of Dyclwyd at Cumbuchan, many of the legends attached to these ancestors tied the house not just to local history, but to events of great significance to Wales and indeed to Britain. In his long account of Owain Glyndwr, um, Pennant's great hero, um, whose reputation and legacy he did much to augment, Pennant gives a full account of the treachery of Howell Seller of Nanai, who ended up being stuffed into a hollow oak tree after a failed assassination attempt on Pennant's great hero. We can also refer to the legend of Richard Ap Howell and Henry Tudor's escape through the window at Mostyn prior to the Battle of Bosworth. And again, referring to Tower near Mould, Pennant's account was dominated by the legend of Reinacht ap Griffith ap Bledin, his valiant defence of Harlech Castle during the Wars of the Roses, and, and his hanging of the Mayor of Chester in his Great Hall. All three of these legends, and many others, first appear in print in Pennant's tour. It is problematic in all three instances to verify the authenticity of these stories. All of these legends later assumed precedence in the heritage of the, the associated sites, and in the case of Mostyn and Nanai, forming primary strands in the family's identities, the presentation of their family identity to the world. 
Likewise, historians of Wales have previously been far too willing to incorporate such legends based on penance accounts into their academic interpretations and analyses of Welsh history. As part of his recreation and celebration of Wales, Pennant was not adverse to augmenting tradition, ransacking the past and transforming it with imagination. The authority of his work in print gave credibility to such stories and in many, many instances allowed them to spread and cultivate like Topsy. These ancestors and their accompanying legends in most cases added significant honour and prestige and character to the house, contributing to its sense of ancientness and historical importance. However, the opposite could also apply. When discussing Acton near Wrexham, Pennant commented that the former owners of the property, the Jeffreys family, were a race that had ran uncontaminated from ancient stock until having the disgrace of producing George Jeffreys, a man of heart subservient to the worst of actions. Jeffreys was an immensely successful lawyer attaining the highest positions in the English legal system, but earned a reputation as the hanging judge following the severity and harshness with which he pursued the rebels implicated in Mon Monmouth's rebellion in 1685. In Pennant's view, his character seems to have had the effect of lessening the worthiness of the house. Likewise, Pennant was content to dismiss the residence of John Jones of Mysa Gardner in Merionne, who had signed the death warrant of Charles I, as a mere ordinary house. A few country houses were not blessed with the strong ancestral ties back into ancient Welsh history so valued by Pennant. One example is the various houses belonging to the Thelwall family in Denbyshire. Originally from Cheshire, the family had settled in and around Rhythin in the medieval period, eventually establishing themselves as one of the most prominent gentry families in North Wales. Uh, with a network of houses and estates, including Plasawart, Barthavan, Clanbeder, Blainial, Plas Koch, and Nant Cluid. The achievements of the family in the 16th and 17th centuries, including the career of the famous lawyer and principal of Jesus College, Oxford, the wonderful na wonderfully named Sir Yubule Thelwell, was enough to merit over three pages in Pennant's tour. Similar attention was afforded to another family of English origin, the Salisbury's, such was their influence on the course of 16th century Welsh history. Despite being of English origin, families such as the Salisbury's and Thelwalls, the Pullistons of Emerald, the Bulkleys of Barren Hill, had been part of Welsh society for centuries, had become fully absorbed into the Welsh gentry and made active contributions towards their localities. Pennant also mentions a few houses which had sprung up from new money, the most famous examples being Bacha Grig and Plas Clough, erected by Richard Clough in the 1560s. Clough was born in Denby as the younger son of a mere glover. He spent a fortune, uh, he made a fortune as a merchant in the service of Sir Thomas Gresham, spending much of his career in the Low Countries and Germany. Whilst discussing Bacher Greig, Pennant refers to the popular saying, he has become a Clough, to describe someone who had attained great riches. Apart from the detailed descriptions of Mostyn and Downing in his history of the parishes of Whitsford and Holywell, Pennant rarely talks about the interiors or the collections of country houses. Pennant's description of the interior of the great gloomy hall at Mostyn served to underline the ancientness of the place, the elevated dais step, the coats of arms chiselled into the fireplace, the arms and armour hanging on the walls together with spoils of the chase, or below the great Nen Bren. But in his tour, the drinking horn or Hirlas horn at Penryn, um, belonging to the old Griffith family, the most powerful family in North Wales during the 15th century, is basically the only item within the country houses of North Wales which commands his attention. The other exceptions to this are some of the portraits which he saw hanging on the walls of the places he visited. He often used these, together with church monuments, as vehicles for discussing more recent members of the Welsh gentry. Sir John Owen's exploits during the Civil War, the career of Richard Clough, and the achievements of Humphrey Lloyd, for example. 
The extra illustrated volumes often include wonderfully awful reproductions of these portraits by Moses Griffiths. I very much doubt that Catherine of Berrein, Mam Cymru and her four husbands would have been impressed. In all seriousness, some of these reproductions are incredibly important, especially the Salisbury of Hloweni portraits, because until very recently, the whereabouts of the originals were unknown. Um, a colleague um, has recently rediscovered them um, in an English country house. The overwhelming majority of houses described by Pennant were still very much alive, playing active roles in their communities and the life of Wales. However, he occasionally lamented the loss of a house through destruction or neglect. One such example is Beth Floyd near Llanidlois. The poor remains of the ancient house of that name stand in the valley. Its masters were the old families of the Floyds, descended from Dingad, son of Tidith Trevor. David, um, 17th in descent from Dingad, took the name of Floyd and probably gave the additional title to the house. It continued in the family sev several generations after and of late years passed by purchase to Sir Edward Lloyd Baronet. In another example, he described Marl near Conwy, a house of fine appearance, but now little more than a case having suffered um, by fire about 40 years ago. It was originally the property of the Hollands. It fell afterwards to Sir Hugh Williams um, and on the death of his grandson, Sir Robert devolved to Sir Thomas Prendergast of Ireland. Um, uh, the degeneration of these properties, the rupturing of the status and influence they had once enjoyed in the localities, represented a significant break with the past and continuity that they had once embodied. Pennant and Moses Griffiths also depict the story of Dufferin Aled an old house. For many generations, the seat of the winds descended from Machid, one of the 15 tribes of North Wales. The last Wynne heiress of the property, in her widowhood, built a new house in a most, most elegant and magnificent manner on the side of the hill opposite to the ancient mansion, only to be disappointed that the very day after the workmen had finished their work, almost the whole casing fell down, which occasioned a vast expense in the repair. Here it should be pointed out that most country houses in Wales were and are the products of almost continual evolution, with each generation making changes, tacking additions and improvements onto the structure they inherited, and in many instances quite deliberately retaining parts of the old building as a symbol of the site's ancestry and to maintain its connection to the past. Just as the buildings changed, so too did their occupants. Those country houses celebrated most heartily by Pennant were those um, which had been inhabited by the same noble family for centuries, as in the example of Cumbuchan. This association provided the strongest links with the history, ancestry and uh, locality. However, in many instances, this, this simply wasn't the case. It's, a, it's one of the major themes of the historiography of, of the 18th century Welsh gentry, that many of the long established gentry families simply died out with significant impact, impacts for culture. Pennant very often in painstaking detail describes the complex changes in ownership through marriage, inheritance and purchase. In most instances, the heritage of the house was simply absorbed into the identity of the new owners, especially if there was a blood connection. However, in some instances, Pennant gives the impression that the break or breaks with the past with heritage and tradition were too severe. This appears to uh, be the case at, 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 at Vainol near Bangor, a house which had long been the residence of the Williams family, who like many other families in North Wales claimed descent from Edna Bedvachan. Um, Pennant describes how the property um, um, eventually through a, a series of, um, of scandal and mischief um, descended to Asherton Smith, of course famous for um, um, development of the Dinorwig uh, slate quarries. Speaking of another property, the, the wonderful uh, Vainor Park in Montgomeryshire, Pennant nar narrated another long series of changes in ownership, lamenting that the house had been alienated to persons foreign to the name and blood. 
Alongside the history and heritage of country houses, Pennant was also interested in their landscape setting, the way they complemented and connected with nature. He was writing during a period when Uverdale Price's theories on the picturesque were extremely popular amongst the landowning classes of England and Wales, with landscape designers such as Capability Brown and William Eames in high demand, including in parts of Wales. As Paul Evans has shown, Pennant was sufficiently attracted by this fashion to commission improvements to the surroundings of his own hall at Downing from the 1760s, exchanging land with his Mostyn neighbours to allow for the development of a consolidated whole. To lay out um, the natural beauties of the place, enlarging the fine scenery of the broken grounds, the woods and the command of the water. In his tour, Pennant regularly highlights the picturesque qualities of country houses. He refers to Pen Bedu in Flintshire as a great ornament to this little valley. Garthewin commanded the most lively view of a fertile little valley bounded with hills covered with hanging woods. Llanidan in Anglesey was finely situated, commanding upwards a beautiful prospect of Carnarvon and the Snowdon Hills and Leeswood, the seat of the late Sir George Wynne, rose palace-like along a fine slope on the south side of the Vale, surrounded with woods and lawn. Winstay was particular worthy of note. The park at Winstay reaches to the village of Ruabon and is most advantageously situated. The grounds well wooded, the views distinct and extremely elegant, especially those towards the Berwyn Mountains and the august breach made into them beyond Llangochen by the rapid D through the country of the irregular and wild Glyndwr. But the most detailed account is of Halston, just over the border in Shropshire, which is highlighted as the exemplar for landscape improvements, the house merging seamlessly into its landscape surroundings. This craze was usually heavily dependent on trees and Pennant was slightly obsessed with trees, uh, with woodlands and their contribution to both the economy and landscapes of estates. Writing in his History of Whitford, he commented on his immense fondness for trees, particularly his ancient favorites. At the very time of writing, he reluc reluctantly signed to his son the death warrant of a few staghorned trees that have far outlived the best of their days. In one part of his tour, he urged the gentry, gentry of Wales to, to plant and preserve your woods, a rallying call not out of place today. Sir Edward Lloyd of Penguerden had recently planted 162,000 trees on his Flintshire estate and over 320,000 on his Pant Glass estate in Carnarvon. Pennant said that Lloyd had contributed um, as a planter um, more to the benefit of his heir and to the state than any other in the principality in this age or in any past. In Anglesey, Pennant commented that in most parts, it is with great difficulty the gentry can raise a plantation around their houses. The woods at Chligui were extensive for the island, and Plas Newydd, the seat of Sir Nicholas Bailey, was praised for being protected on three sides by venerable oaks and ashes. Likewise, Coitmore in Bethesda was seated in the midst of lofty trees, every now and then opening so as to admit a view of the exalted mountains and rocks soaring above with misty tops. Elsewhere in Carnarvonshire, the adjacent houses of Bodis Gachen and Glodaif were also praised for their extensive plantations. Bodis Gachen is a fine situation, environed with woods, from a neglected terrace is a most beautiful view over the tops of trees of Conwy, part of the river and the vast, vast mountains which, from the background of the pros which form the background of the prospect. Into Denbyshire, Gwynonog was fronted by the most majestic oaks in our principality. The fine wooded dingles belonging to the demise, um, demean are extremely well worth visiting. They are most judiciously cut into the walks by the owner John Middleton and afford beautiful scenery in their kind as we have any to boast. Penance was also interested in individual trees. At, ba at Abachumbid on the road between Riffin and Denby, he referred to the very fine chestnut trees, uh, one of which is nearly 24 feet in circumference. And whilst at Nanai, he concentrated on the legend of Cabren Erechich, 
The estate is covered with fine woods which clove all sides of the dingles for many miles. On the roadside is a venerable oak in the last stage of decay and pierced by age into a form of a Gothic arch. Yet its present girth is 27 feet and a half. Its name is very classical. Derwen Kreibrenner Echich, the hollow oak, the haunt of demons, the tree into which the body of Howell Seller of Nanai was stuffed after his failed assassination attempt on Owen Glendur. Trees played an incredibly important role um, in the country house landscapes, the glory of our estates, said Thomas Pennant. In his history of Whitsford and Hollywell, Pennant provides a detailed account of land, land use and management on his own and neighbouring estates under the heading husbandry, referring to soil types, livestock, crops, agricultural practices, and to his relations with his tenant farmers. Our rents are moderate because our gentry would blush to add one dish to their table at the expense of the tenant, he says. The account gives an indication of the wider influence of the country house in rural Wales, where agriculture was still a key part of life. The observations are rarely repeated in his tour, though he lamented that in parts of Gwynedd, notwithstanding the laudable example of the gentry, the country is in an unimproved estate, neglected for the sake of the herring fishery. Wales by this time, of course, was not just a land of agriculture. Parts of it were quickly industrialising. Pennant, like his predecessors at Downing and the owners of other estates in, in, in the locality, had long worked to exploit the mineral resources on their lands, particularly lead and coal. Pennant comments that the old coal shafts in the park at Mostyn came almost as close as the front door. Furthermore, the Hollywell part of Pennant's local history, with its detailed account of the booming industries of the Greenfield Valley, is a sharp contrast to the rurality of neighbouring Whitsford. Across many parts of Wales, the owners of country houses, in addition to speculators from near Anafar, were inv investing in mineral extraction. The Grosvenor family of Eaton's mineral interests pepper Pennant's accounts of North East Wales, and Sir Piers Mostyn of Talacra's quarry at Gwesper was hailed for the excellence of the freestone. Pennant provides a full account of Paris copper mine on Anglesey, a venture which enriched the families at Plas Newydd and, and Fleece Dillas. Meanwhile, over the Menai Straits in Carnarvonshire, Pennant commented that Lord Penryn had added greatly to the population of the county by the improvements he has made in the slate business. The quarries have become now the source of a prestigious commerce. This invest investment, largely derived from the profits of transatlantic slavery, had led to the creation of a new transport route through Nantes Francon, an enlargement of Porth Penryn, a site for manufacturing writing slates, and the construction of multiple houses and cottages to, to the design of Mr. Wyatt. Interestingly, Pennant recommended that the curious traveller ride to the quarries to see the works and the laudable changes um, in the area of this once desolate country. Similar praise is heaped on Mr F Fitz Morris of Hloweni, who was investing in local industry. To Pennant, he was an exemplar of a gentleman interested in the public good. Over the course of the next century, industrialization and its accompanying social change was, was to have an immense impact on the nature of the country house in Wales. Thomas Pennant's tours were to have a significant impact um, in terms of how Wales was understood, especially in England, encouraging um, lots of English tourists into, into Wales, but also providing a template for further travel writing about Wales. In Wales too, his works proved to be hugely popular with the gentry, though there, there's not many country house libraries in North Wales that, that did not have a copy of Thomas Pennant. This presentation today has formed part of the, the broader work of the Institute for the Study of Welsh Estates at Bangor University, which seeks to um, understand um, the history and culture and landscapes of Wales through the prisms of these places, through estates and country houses, and especially through the archives that they produced over the course of their, of their existence. Um, thank you very much for listening to my talk today, and I'd be delighted to try and answer any questions that you have um, about the presentation or the broader work of the institute.
Institute. Diochen uh, Baudian, thank you very much. Mute myself. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sean. Uh, I just wanted to um, highlight this speech. You've been asked to enter it into a publication, haven't you? Visitors and Country Houses. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, of, of course. So um, one of the academic institutions that we work quite closely with is the Centre for the Study of Historic Irish Houses and Estates, which is based in Maynooth in, in Ireland. And every year they host a, a historic houses conference. And from that, they um, they develop a, a series of edited um, papers uh, which are published. And um, this a version of this talk is going to be published as part of the next volume on that edited by Terry Dooley and Chris Ridgway. Um, so, so that should be available by the end of the year or, or early next year, surely. Okay, thank you. On behalf of Pema Mauer Museum and Historical Society, I'd like to thank Dr. Sean Evans for his excellent tour around ancient houses in North Wales. Plenty for us to uh, get our head round, really, and start to read Pennant. <laughs>